Good morning. Good morning. And welcome on this Holy Trinity Sunday. This morning, Bishop Tim Smith posted something on Facebook that uh, one of the church's uh, well-known theologians used to call this Heresy Sunday because the minute you try to explain the Holy Trinity, you're probably going to end up being a heretic. <laughs> so it's, it's the one church festival that we have to celebrate church doctrine. Um, so uh, bear with me this morning. <laughs> bear with me. Anyway, welcome on this Holy Sunday Trinity. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for Vacation Bible School uh, on, in the narthex, and we are looking for people to provide meals and for people to take on two, maybe three of the uh, workshops each day. Each day we'll have three different workshops that, that people will process through. Um, there'll be one for outside game, outside water games, um, and if it's raining, a video, arts and crafts, and one for science. So um, you don't have to commit to the whole, you don't need to commit to the whole uh, week. You only need to commit to um, one or two days. That would be great. That would be very, very helpful. Uh, There is the friendship group is going for dinner on Tuesday night at Blue Ocean. Where is Blue Ocean? Clinton. Clinton. Okay. Very good. Right off 26. Okay. Neil and I took a drive the other night and, and drove from here to Clinton. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was, it was um, quite desolate. <laughs> But it was also, it was, an, it was a nice trip. So um, those are all the announcements I have. Are there, is there anything that I should be, that you have that needs to be announced this morning? All right. If so, uh, I invite you now to stand for the confession. Oh, I do have one more announcement. The little lavalier microphone, I changed the battery in it last week, and that was a mistake because the microphone has has had some battery acid get into it, and when I took out the old, the old battery, the new battery's not working, won't connect correctly, so it's not working. So I will not be able to use that lavalier mic, and we need to look into uh, finding a way to repair that or uh, jerry-rig something else. So I apologize for not having that microphone. I invite you now to stand for the confession.
Yeah, that was my last announcement. Happy Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> now would you please stand for the confession? Gracias. 
first reading is from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphites were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory, of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraphim touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me the word of the Lord.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen. Today's first lesson is the story of Isaiah's calling, of the vision, the dream that led him into the profession of prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the master sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robes filled the temple. Isaiah is one of the most often quoted prophets in the New Testament, and he was a man with a great deal of political clout, and he was a spokesperson for God. As a spokesperson for God, he advised the king to avoid an alliance with Egypt. Isaiah urged a passive position in the face of war against the Assyrians. But before he was a trusted advisor to the king, he was a man who had a strange dream, a vision. The Jerusalem temple is the grandest of buildings in Jerusalem at the time of Isaiah. Solomon invested heavily in the masterpiece of architecture. He brought in skilled laborers from other nations. It was the largest building in all of Judah and the pride and glory of the Jewish nation. Now in this prophetic vision, Isaiah finds himself in the temple looking up at God. God who is so large, so vast, that the hem of his robes fill the temple. It's like God is a giant. And Isaiah is standing on the floor of the temple looking up at this gigantic being like an ant might look up at you or me. But remember that this is a vision and a dream. And in visions and dreams, things are not always what they seem. Isaiah is not claiming that God is a giant, but rather that God is too big for our comprehension. We cannot comprehend God, and that is a great lesson for the festival of the Holy Trinity. Because trying to understand the Holy Trinity is like trying to see the whole of God in this vision. I always wonder, when I look at this passage, what exactly could Isaiah see? Could Isaiah even see anything beyond the knees of God? Could he see the hands and the face of God? So this passage is a reminder to us that God is too big for us to perceive, to understand, and it is a reminder that the nature of God is a mystery. We cannot fully understand God on this side of heaven. In fact, I believe that the very nature of God is illogical and does not make sense to us. It is like insisting that one plus one plus one is one. And when we speak of the Holy Trinity, that's true. It's what I call God math. One plus one plus one equals one. God's ways, God's understandings, they are not like ours. In the first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul wrote, 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We don't talk enough about the mystery of God because we live in an age where knowledge is important, where we look to science and where science can become an idol and a place where we lay our faith. That's not to say I'm against science. The truth is I enjoy science. From science, we have great tools, medicine, vaccines, technology, and a thirst to know more. But there are some things in this world that we simply cannot comprehend, things that we cannot prove with science, things that we will have to take on faith. That's not always easy for me, either. I want scientific proof of God. I want archaeology to give evidence of the life of Jesus, of his death and resurrection. I want scientific proof of the soul and of heaven. I'm not alone. Humans have struggled with trying to prove the existence of God using evidence for a long time. In fact, in the 1800s, they would sometimes weigh someone on the verge of death. And then after they died, weigh them again to see if they could find if, if the soul had weight. Because they were trying to prove the presence of a soul. But here's the thing. If we had proof, if we had evidence, then we would not need faith. The book of Hebrews reminds us that faith is the confidence that what we hoped for will happen. It gives us assurance of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. That's the message version. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. By faith, not by knowledge. And when it comes to God and to Jesus and the Holy Trinity, we have to walk by faith recognizing that we will never fully understand God until we have arrived in the life that awaits us beyond this life. The only certainty we have is this. God is good all the time. God is merciful and kind, and God is generous. We hear this in 1 John. For God so loved the world, he gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have whole and lasting life. God did not go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. The Son came to help, to put the world right again. Again, the message version. Our first reading is the story of a man called to serve God. Notice that God didn't ask for his educational background or his theological resume. God doesn't say that Isaiah needs to be a genius or especially holy. Isaiah's call begins with forgiveness, with the grace of God, with God responding to a man who recognizes his own sinfulness and unworthiness in the presence of God. And I said, 
Woe is me. I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lip, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. The calling of Isaiah begins in the grace of God in the proclamation of forgiveness. We can never fully understand God, but we can say for certain that God loves us to the point of death and to resurrection. And God invites us, like God invited Isaiah, to be his voice in the world. Not to condemn the world, as John 3, 17 reminds us, but to tell the world how Jesus has changed us, how the Holy Spirit has moved us, and how God the Father has named us and claimed us as heirs to his kingdom. Amen. Our next hymn is Come Join the Dance of Trinity. church leaders gathered in the city of Nicaea to define the core beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ. This confession we say together has been handed down to us from that day. Let us now confess our common faith, joining the saints of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen.
Let us come before the triune God in prayer. We pray, O oh God, for your holy church around the world. Revitalize and renew us that we may be reborn once again through the waters of baptism and the blowing wind of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for your power revealed to us in creation, for cedar and oak trees, for rushing waters, for the echoes of thunder. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations and our leaders that, that led by your spirit, they work toward a world where all your children enjoy peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils that surround them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. We pray for healing for all those who suffer, especially victims and survivors of trauma and violence. Give respite to those living with PTSD or any other mental health concerns. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We will pray for this worshiping community of Colin Lutheran Church, that the splendor of your majesty and the holiness of your mystery may be glorified through our worship in relationship with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, and merc Almighty and merciful God, you are the only source of health and healing. You alone can bring calmness and peace. Be with those who have been asked to, whom we have been asked to pray, especially Cheryl Beatonball, Tim and Terry Beatonball, Patsy Chapel, Barry Dow, Bernice Fort, Juanita Fulmer, B. Harrison, Shelby Harlow, Melissa Hutchinson, Melinda Janika, Craig, Jacqua, Simon Keel, Francis Long, Joe Morris, Dan Rochelle, Judy Sadler, Marilyn Schroeder, Bernice Sheely, Kat Sheely, Pat and Steve Weiss, Morgan Word. Grant to them and to, and to us and all your children an awareness of your presence and a strong confidence in you. In your pain, our weariness, and our anxiety, surround us with your care. Protect us by your loving might and permit us once more to enjoy help and strength and peace. Hear us, O Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those struggling economically because of this virus, small business struggling to stay open, and those unemployed and unemployed, hear us, O God, we pray for you. We give you thanks, O God, for those who have died in the faith. We remember those, remember also those whose lives have been lost due to the horrors of the war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting your body, grace. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where, the, where there is hatred, then so will I. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is spare, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to, to be consoled as to be consoled, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in parting that we are parted, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.